The problem is, is that my son is very spoiled, and I realize that it's my fault. It's 100% my fault. When he first came into my life, when he was seven years old, he was very appreciative. Everything was thank you. Everything was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Big old hug. Thank you, I love you, thank you. <laughs> and what I did was, is that I started giving him stuff. And I never expected anything for it. And you know, with me, I was always like, you know, I work really hard to have nice things. And is it a crime that I want my family to have nice things? I figure, you know what, I went through a lot. I just want my son to have the best. But you can't always give them everything because then they don't learn to appreciate and value things. And I had to find out the hard way. Uh. Mm. It takes a lot for me to tell you guys that, by the way. This is a freaking messed up. My girl pointed it out. She goes, you're messing up. I go, what am I doing wrong? She goes, you don't let them earn anything. You don't let them try. You don't let them make an attempt to try to work towards something. So, of course, he doesn't appreciate things. And it was very evident last month. You know, birthday time. I bought him a pair of Jordans. Not just a regular pair of Jordans. They were a special collector's edition pair of Jordans. You know the kind of Jordans where people wait in line the night before just so they can buy these shoes? Except I didn't because <laughs> I got the hookup. Yeah. <laughs> they were really nice shoes, $180 pair of shoes. And yeah, hey, a lot of jokes. So I didn't even wrap them. Okay, I put them on the box and I waited for him to walk in the room. And I'm standing there and he walks in. I go, happy birthday. And he sees the shoes. He looks at the shoes and all he says is, cool. That's it, cool. Sometimes I'll get lucky. He'll say it twice, cool, cool. And then he walks around to see what other presents there are. And I told his mom, did you see that? Did you see? Don't get mad. I told you, you don't let him earn anything. Now that's why he acts that way. He expects things. I'm like, oh. And I want to get upset, but she's absolutely right. He's at the point now of spoiled where he walks up to me and he goes, Dad, I'm really bored with my Nintendo Wii. Can I give it to my friend Angel? I go, what did you just say? <laughs> I'm bored with my Nintendo Wii. Can I give it away? I go, is it broken? No. How long have you had it? Woo, for like four years. I go, how many games do you have for the Nintendo Wii? Like 300? I could feel you judging me over there. I felt that. Oh, you're freaking, you're judging me right now. I could feel it. She's <laughs> over there. She's like, this is some Dr. Phil shit right here. He really messed him up. And I heard you. Let me just for the record, let me set this straight, okay? I did not buy my son 300 games. Here's what happened. I have a friend who's a computer hacker, and for 75 bucks, he put 300 games on my son's hard drive. Yes, I have money, but I'm still ghetto. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I tell Frankie, do you realize how lucky you are? And then he rolls his eyes, oh, lucky. I go, yeah, dude, you are. I says, you got a Nintendo Wii that works. You've had it for four years and it still works. If something happens to it, I can take it back to the store, get you a new one because I got a warranty that'll last you another four years. Why is that a big deal? Because when I was your age, I had a Nintendo. Wii? No. <laughs> Frankie, in 1987, I had a thing called a Nintendo Entertainment System, okay? Nintendo Entertainment System. It didn't last four years. It lasts 90 days. 90 days is what it took for you to hit power and start seeing a flashing red screen. You know the flashing red screen where you have to look at the ground or look away or you have a seizure right then and there? Oh yeah. And then what you had to do is you had to flip the Nintendo over and there was a silver sticker, a silver sticker with an 800 number on it. And you call the 800 number and they put you in contact with someone in Japan who made you feel like a pendejo. Oh yeah, he made you feel stupid. You call him up and he's like, it costs 250 to repair Nintendo. 250 to fix it, but it's 150 for a brand new one. And if you couldn't afford 150 for a brand new one, like we couldn't afford 150 for a brand new one, you had to become a technician at the age of seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. You had to go in the kitchen and find the most messed up butter knife you could, right? The one that had bent marks and rust stains and take that sucker back in the living room because you were gonna perform an operation. You were gonna perform an operation and bring that Nintendo back to life.
You had to work to play. You had to unplug it, plug it back in. Power reset, power reset, power reset. It was like performing CPR. You'd hold a cartridge and then it was like, you push it down, you push it up, you push it down, you push it up, push it down, you push it up, push it down, you push it up. Give it oxygen. And if you were lucky, if you were lucky, you'd hear the magical sound. Dun, 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 dun. It's alive! It's alive! You were more happy about making your game work than actually playing it back in the day. Frankie will never know about having to repair his game system in order to play it. He'll never have to deal with the cartridge. He barely has to touch the disc. Most of the games now, you stream it through Wi-Fi. And if the Wi-Fi is messing up, you're not going to fix Wi-Fi the same way you'd fix an old school Nintendo cartridge. That doesn't work. Wi-Fi's out. Hold on. <laughs> Try it again. <laughs> you can't touch Wi-Fi. Gadgets and devices now are so delicate and sensitive. You can't touch anything. Everything requires a specialist or a technician to come over and fix it. Back in the day, gadgets and appliances work so much better when you apply just a little violence to them. <laughs> you didn't have to call a repair person. If you had a big screen TV and there was lines going through the middle, how would you fix it? Right? And what happened? Ta-da! <laughs> Let you try that method tonight on a flat screen and see what happens. Stupid flat screen. <laughs> Broke it! Pick it up right there, I got a warranty. Come on, let's go. I told a story, a story that went viral called the racist gift basket story. The story itself is about 15 minutes long, okay? I'm gonna give you the three minute version of that story so you understand what's going on. Basically, Martin and I are doing a show in Sacramento, California. We're driving from LA to Sacramento. We're passing through a small town called Fresno. As we're passing through Fresno, we reach out to the local promoter who does the shows there. We're good friends with him. And he tells us, you know, because we're trying to have lunch. And he goes, he's busy, but by the way, G. Riley's in town. And we're like, oh shoot, our friend G. Riley's in town. He's at the hotel. All right, he's at the hotel. We knew exactly where he was at. So I say, Martin, how about we go and visit G? Martin goes, let's stop by. I figured first, let's go pick up some soda, some drinks, so we can surprise him. So we get to the market, as soon as we walk in the door, we see a whole pile of gift baskets. Martin goes, we should get him a gift basket. I said, Martin, G. Riley doesn't like gift baskets, okay? He doesn't like the fancy wine and the fancy cheese and the sausage. He definitely hates crackers. <laughs> you don't even know why that's so funny. But anyways, I said, how about this, Martin? He doesn't know we're coming. Let's have a little fun with him. How about we make him? A racist gift basket. And Martin goes, what's that? I go, you know, Martin, a racist gift basket. A gift basket designed to have fun with whatever race you're trying to mess with. Now, in G's case, he's black. It was easy. <laughs> now, I say easy not to be an ass. I say easy because there's so many stereotypes attached to African Americans. So, we have this empty gift basket. What do we put in it? Fried chicken, watermelon, Kool-Aid, grape soda, barbecued potato chips, sunflower seeds, an ebony magazine, a Chris Rock DVD called Bigger and Blacker, Magnum condoms, Newport cigarettes, a rack of ribs, the recipe for cornbread. We put everything but a white girl with a big ass in the basket. We wrapped it up really nice, we put a big bow on it, and we took it to the hotel. We had the girl at the front desk delivered to his room. Martin and I are waiting in the hallway where he can't see us. So she knocks on the door. G. Riley opens the door, she gives him the gift basket, he says thank you, closes the door. Martin and I run over to the door and we start listening to him opening up the gift basket. As he's opening it, he's getting excited and he is enjoying every single thing he is pulling out of that basket. He is loving this basket until he realizes it's a practical joke. And then he freaks out because he read the greeting card. The greeting card <laughs> freaked him out because now he thinks that the KKK sent the gift basket. <laughs> now some of you are like, why does he think that? Cause that's what we wrote. 
If you're gonna do a practical joke, you go big or you go home is what I'm trying to say. So he freaks out and he tries to run out of the hotel room. As soon as he gets in the hallway, he sees Martin and I laughing and he puts two and two together. So then he cusses us out, he forgives us, gives us a hug, high five, we go back in his room and then I eat his chicken. <laughs> what winds up happening is that story goes crazy on Comedy Central. People are giving him a hard time, so they pull it. Next thing you know, I upload it through YouTube. YouTube, 10 million views it gets on YouTube. Then they flag it because the word racist is on the title, so it gets pulled off. So then I re-upload it, it gets another 10 million, then I had people share it. All in all, the video's probably gotten about a little over 100 million views. So here's what happened. Just like the chocolate cakes, The diet soda and the deodorant. Before you know it, people started bringing me Mexican racist gift baskets. <laughs> now, when it first started happening, listen guys, I'm not gonna lie, it was actually kinda cute because it was only other Mexicans bringing me these quote unquote Mexican racist gift baskets. It started in LA after a show. This one guy walks up to me with a basket and he's like, hey, what's up, homie? Got your racist gift basket. I said, we're the same race. Hey, yeah, whatever. All right, whatever. <laughs> I take it backstage and all the items in the basket made it to my house. There was a Mexican blanket with a tiger on it, a bunch of bottles of Fanta, bottles of Sangria, Vicente Fernandez CDs, Mexican candy, pan dulce, sweet bread, mazapanes. Everything made it to my house. Now, the more East Coast we started traveling and the more down South we started performing, the more <laughs> creative <laughs> the gift baskets started getting. Fast forward to Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> oh, it gets good. <laughs> Earlier tonight, before we kicked off this special, my friend Martin was out here making a couple of announcements. One of the announcements that he made was, if you brought a gift, please hold on to it until after the show. Don't bring it to the stage. It could interrupt the flow of the performance. The only reason why he makes this announcement every single night is because of one show in Mobile. So here's what happens. I tell the entire racist gift basket story, the full 16 minutes, right? As soon as I finish, a guy from the back of the theater rushes the front of the stage. Now keep in mind, this area is full. In Mobile, the aisle was right up the middle. So the guy had a clean shot to me. He hauled ass like it was the prize is right, all the way down. <laughs> Much like tonight, there was security there that night. Security sees the guy with the basket, but no one thought to stop him. All they did was, that's pretty. <laughs> oh, that's nice, that's pretty, yeah. So the guy makes it all the way to the front, he takes the gift basket and he puts it on the stage. Now he's heckling me from where you're sitting. I'm standing here and he's like, Fluffy! <laughs> What's up, dude? I got this for you. Thank you. Open it. I go, sir, we're kind of in the middle of a show right now. I says, I appreciate the gift. That's very nice of you. I says, but uh, how about this? I'll, I'll open it after the show. Oh, come on, Fluffy. I want to see your face. Um, sir, how about this? How about you take the gift basket and you bring it over here to the side of the stage where security's at and I'll have security escort you behind the curtain and then I'll open it up backstage with you in front of me. How's that? And he's not taking no for an answer. Now the problem is the crowd just saw me tell the racist gift basket story and all of a sudden there's a guy with a gift basket. They have no idea I'm not affiliated with freaking Duck Dynasty in the front row. <laughs> So now I'm trying to defuse the situation before it gets crazy, but he's not taking no for an answer. Next thing you know, he does something no other audience member has ever done in my 19 plus years as a comedian. He takes the whole crowd away from me, flips them, and then uses them on me in five seconds. It was the most amazing, horrific thing I have ever witnessed. <laughs> this is all he did. Come on, Fluffy! We want to see your face! We want to see your face! We want to see your... He gets 2,000 people behind him to start chanting, We want to see your face! We want to see your face! It was very evident this was not the first rally he's ever led. 
the crowd is so loud, I can no longer hear myself over the monitor. So I'm like, I lost. So I get on my hands and knees, I put the microphone down, I grab the gift basket, and I start tearing it open. I reach in. Forget about pulling out Mexican soda, Mexican candy, or a Mexican blanket. This dude was a pro. I started pulling out gardening tools. I'm pulling out a rake, a toy shovel, a toy leaf blower. Dig deeper, Flappa, dig deeper. I pull out a soccer ball. I go, dude, it says Puerto Rico. They ran out of Mexico. I pull out a brick. I go, what's the brick for? The wall. I pull out an actual application for U.S. citizenship. I said, there's no way this can get any worse. Dig deeper. I was wrong. I pull out an old school box of Crayola crayons. You know the 64 pack that has a sharpener in the back? Okay. There's a window on the front of the crayon so you can see all of the colors that are in the box. All of the crayons in the box are brown except for one white crayon right in the middle. And I said, what the hell is that supposed to mean? And he looks at me and he says, welcome to my world. <laughs> and for the record, I'm not fat, I'm fluffy. For those of you who still don't know, there are five levels of fatness. Fluffy is one of the levels. There's big, healthy, husky, fluffy, and damn! I'm still number four. People go, how do you know when you're number five? Well, because people will tell you, you know? If you try to get on an elevator that's crowded and people stop you and go, uh uh! Damn! If you go to Disneyland and little kids want to ride you, I'm sorry, little kids are too honest, man. They're like little alcoholics. You know, and as far as, you know, Disneyland, I love Disneyland, but they're not fluffy friendly. They're not, man. They care about safety, you know? And that sucks, because I can handle one bar. One bar, I'm cool. But now they got the whole, you know. If you're fluffy, one of those is not gonna lock. You're trying. People are in line. You can do it! One time I took a trip with my buddy Mondo, right? Big guy, another big guy. And uh, I went with him because his family, you know, they decided to go and he didn't want to be the only one hanging out by the strollers. <laughs> so we're hanging out and at the end of the day, my buddy Mondo goes, dude, we should get on a ride. I go, which one? They all, we can't get on none of them, dude, we're too big. He goes, there's a ride here at Disneyland. It's called Splash Mountain. I go, what is that? He goes, it's a log and you get inside the log and it goes uphill, goes down, makes a splash. No seatbelt, no pull bar. You just get in and go. I go, no seatbelt, no pull bar? <laughs> so we get in line for it, right? We're all pumped up and I see people getting off the ride with these little note cards. I go, what are those? He goes, oh, they take a photo of you when you go downhill. Oh, okay, cool. So we get to the front of the line and then we have to deal with the lady with the headset. The lady who takes her job way too serious. Okay, how many people? Four, okay. Two here, two here. How many? Five? Okay, three there, two there. And we get to the front. How many people? <laughs> who cares? We get our own boat, right? We take off. <laughs> We're splishing and splashing like little kids. <laughs> three minutes go by, the moment of truth. We get to the hill, right? <laughs> My buddy Mondo turns around and he says, dude, let's flash the camera. I said, you're stupid. I'm down. So as soon as it let us go, right? We get off the ride, we are soaking wet. We're like, We're all rosado right here. 
We got a mean old baby rash. We go to buy the picture, and there's a lady behind the counter with her hand on the screen. And I asked my buddy Mondo, I said, bro, what boat are we? He says, 22. I go, she's covering 22. He goes, oh, we better sneak out of here. Oh, yeah, we're going to sneak out. <laughs> we get past the picture, girl, but then we get stopped by Disney security. And you have not lived until you've been stopped by a freaky man wearing a badge in the shape of a mouse. <laughs> this guy was like, hold on, hold on a second. Ma'am, move your hand away from the screen. You guys see what I see here? That's a disgrace to this park. We can't believe anyone could take such a photo. My question to you guys, do you recognize the two big women in this picture? <laughs> and it wasn't until we walked over to this photo that my buddy Armando and I realized something about ourselves. And that is that when two full-grown fluffy men are going downhill at a 45 degree angle with no shirts on going like this, we both look like sexy bitches. <laughs> but me and Disney, no, no mas. But I had to because I messed up. I fell asleep on the couch and I woke up all, you know, and Frankie was watching TV. He goes, look here, bro, look, Disneyland. And I was like, dude, what's the big deal? Okay, it's Disneyland. What, you never gone? <laughs> my dad never took me. Oh, <laughs> Next morning. Welcome to the magical world of Disney. We walk in the park, he's all happy. <laughs> we get into the middle of the park, and he's so funny, he starts getting winded. I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> because up until then, I only saw myself get like that, you know? <laughs> so to see a little 10-year-old version of <laughs> hysterical, I was dying. I go, Frankie, you want to take a break? Mm-hmm. Gabriel, this park is big. <laughs> I'm like, see? It's not a small world after all. <laughs> like, whatever, dude. Sit down. So we're sitting down, waiting. All of a sudden, I start getting recognized at Disneyland. And that, for me, was cool. You know, people are walking by. <laughs> Fluffy, can we take a picture? Sure. Then, <laughs> more people. It's him. <laughs> it's that guy. <laughs> Pikachu. <laughs> Now I have like 10 people around me, like I'm a new character at the park. <laughs> Best part is Frankie starts getting annoyed. He's like, mm, why don't they leave you alone? Frankie, these are the people that come to the shows. They're the reason why you have a PlayStation. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going here and I'll start taking the pictures. <laughs> so I told Frankie, Frankie, what ride are you going to get on? Right? Yeah. What ride do you want to get on? I don't want to get on the ride. What the hell are we doing at Disneyland? <laughs> the commercial said that Disneyland is the happiest place on earth. Oh my God. That's IHOP. <laughs> what the hell are we doing here?